video. Okay, so first, what defines an external flow? Right. So uh, in the previous chapter, it was entirely flow through pipes, right? Things in enclosed conduits uh, where the flow is confined within the walls of our pipe or conduit. Um, and so in this final chapter, we're going to start discussing the flows around objects where uh, it's in contact with the outer surface of that object. Uh, let's go ahead and make this. So, no, it's too thin. Okay, so the external here indicates that the flow around the outside of a of a body. Applications here, right, include everything from wings and aircraft. To, uh, all right, to boats, to flow around buildings or other structures, buildings and civil structures. Now, when we consider the flow around things like this, or um, I, should, I should mention here that this, this sort of encompasses two uh, this dichotomy and the way we uh, I think of fluids, right? If we think about aircraft or boats, these are objects moving through a stationary fluid. Um, and buildings are civil structures, usually you have a fluid moving past a stationary object. Uh, we'll see in a second that we treat those in the exact same way. But for all of these, um, our principal concerns are what are the forces? Okay. What's the lift? What's the drag? If we're dealing with uh, um, things like vehicles, Okay. Aircraft, cars, boats. Uh, what's the drag on that object exerted or, or resulting from its own motion? And if we're dealing with buildings or civil structures, right? We're interested in knowing what the necessary uh, the necessary structure of that building is to withstand some wind load. Um, so we're generally interested. Lift and drag. And then uh, in some cases, we're also interested in the actual flow fields. Okay, so by that I mean <coughs> the velocity fields and the resulting flow patterns. And so the example I give for this. Uh, the second one is if we're interested in designing, for example, uh, a farm of wind turbines. This is a, a very uh, quality figure looking down at a wind turbine. Um, if we were to, uh, and there's some really interesting studies that are actually able to, to, to do really good camera-based imaging of the flow around wind turbines, but the idea is um, that wind entering this way is going to hit the wind turbine and result in this, we call this wake field. All right. Now, um, the folks designing the, uh, the distribution of wind turbines generally like to distribute them in this sort of staggered pattern. Okay. But what happens then is that the wake from this upstream wind turbine hits the ones downstream, and the ones downstream also create this sort of their own wake fields. But you end up with this, this uh, interference region, and then in the downstream also see the interference of those upstream, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it, it pays to be cognizant not only of forces, but of flow patterns that result from flow around objects as well. So, before we, uh, we, we dive into this, 
I want to state one assumption and one fact. So the first assumption is we're going to assume that the flows in this chapter are steady state. And then under this assumption, there's a fact that the object moving through a stationary fluid is equivalent to a static object in a moving fluid. All right. So some object moving with a velocity of u can be exchanged for that same object standing still placed into a, uh, a velocity or a field, a fluid with a, a uniform velocity. Okay, we're going to change tracks for a second and discuss the concepts of lift and drag. Okay, so the premise here is that any object, any body, be it a car, building, plane, etc., is um, that is placed in contact with a moving fluid, or by extension, is moving through a stationary fluid. Uh, is going to interact with that fluid through mutually exerted stresses. stresses come in two flavors, both of which we have discussed pretty extensively uh, earlier in the course. Those being normal stresses or pressure and tangential stresses. are also known as shear stress. Now I want to emphasize at this point okay, that these two stresses are the only physical mechanisms that a fluid has as, at its disposal uh, for exerting any kind of influence on a body. Okay, so all of the forces stem from these two types of stresses. So we're going to consider briefly the flow around, this is a very classic uh, type of body known as an airfoil. Okay. This is the uh, representative of a very simplified type of um, uh, wing section. And it's being placed in a uniform flow. Now, as the flow is uh, predictably deflected around the outside of this airfoil section, these stresses are going to be exerted, as I said, first through the shear stress around the outside. Okay. And also through a combination of positive and negative pressures on this body. So 
we're going to consider. Oops. Okay, so what this is indicate, uh, meant to indicate is that flow that moves around the other side of this is going to exert a positive pressure on the underside of this wing section. This is something uh, that you saw in the final lab, feeling the flow around that airfoil section. And flow that moves over the top is going to exert some normal okay, force or some normal stress uh, that we know as pressure as a suction uh, influence. And then in addition, the flow of the top, uh, bottom and the top will uh, result in this skin friction, okay, this red uh, skin uh, friction that is known as the shear stress. Now if we were to take all of these stresses and integrate them, what we're going to get, okay, the, as we do when we integrate stresses, we'll find uh, that we can boil down these combined normal and tangential stresses. Right. Make that a little bit prettier. That they'll all boil down into a single okay, resultant force. Now this resultant force is nice, but what we're really interested in as engineers are the two components, okay? Or, or we're interested in decomposing this resultant force into its two constituent parts in, uh, which we know as the, the lift and the drag force. And then the lift, which we indicate through this script L, uh, is defined as the force acting perpendicular to the direction of the upstream. Oops. Flow. Okay, so with the flow coming in horizontally here, the lift is that component of our resultant force that acts normal to it. And the drag, script D, is the force acting parallel to the upstream flow. So the next question that follows is, how to calculate, oops, yeah, there we go, lift and drag. Mathematically, right? So, given we, we we throw some object into a moving fluid, or we drag some object through a stationary one, uh, how do we leverage math in order to get these force components? 
Okay. And as I implied earlier, the answer is integration. Okay. It's a calculus problem. We know that the interaction of an object and a moving fluid creates stresses, and we integrate those stresses around the outside of an object in order to get forces. So we're going to consider, <clears throat> um, you know, if we have the, the flow around some arbitrarily shaped object, we're going to do this for one simple part of this. So let's zoom in on a little segment, okay, or a little little portion of the surface area here. We'll assume that this surface area, okay, can be approximated as um, being planar, okay, and it's oriented at some angle theta from uh, the, sorry, take that back. It is oriented so that its normal vector, okay, is oriented at some angle theta, and this is sort of a weird definition um, but we'll, we'll, we'll loop back to this in just a moment. We're going to define our x and y coordinate system here. Okay, and we're um, going to assume okay, that the flow is uniform. And that as the flow hits this object, it exerts first, okay, a, uh, oh my gosh, undo that, there we go, a small pressure force, that is a pressure times a small area, okay, and frictional force, that is some shear stress tau times dA. Okay, dA being is the surface area of this little and of course the, uh, the combination of this pressure and the shear stress will be exerted as a resultant force. Can I give me a moment while I make this a little bit larger? There we go. Redraw this a little bit more legibly. P D A Tau A. And the two conspire to make this small right, force. Now on the surface, we've already defined a normal vector, but um, oops, there's also okay, a tangential unit vector. Okay, so we've got our, our global x, y, which is horizontal and vertical, uh, but we've got a normal tangential coordinate system that's defined on this little element of the surface. So there's, right, we're interested in the total force acting on this, which is comprised of, again, lift and drag, but we'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, but the force is the integral over the uh, total surface area, okay, of these little component forces, df, which 
can be written as the integral over s tau, oops, of tau dA plus the integral over s of negative p dA. So all this is saying is that uh, the total force is the integral of the shear stress acting tangentially and separately we're splitting out the component of the uh, force acting normal to the surface, writing that as negative p okay, times that normal vector, again times the small elemental surface area dA. Now that negative sign leading the p right here is included simply because we're defining positive as pressure when acting in towards that surface. Okay, positive pressure pushes on an object. Um, now, we're going to split this up a little bit. And this is, uh, say that we can now split this into, um, or rather, sorry. Uh, now, if we want to recast this in terms of the x and y components, we've got to recognize that the, the normal unit vector okay, can be written as negative cosine theta i plus sine theta j. Okay, this is how we're linking that normal vector to our xy written here. And then our tangential unit vector is likewise written sine theta i plus cosine theta j. So plugging those in, and I'm going to skip the intermediate step here. Okay, and I'm work. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to belabor the uh, the derivation here. Um, but the idea is that we can take these and substitute them in wherever we have a normal or tangential unit vector in order to recast this. And then through some reorganization, we get this is the surface integral of tau cosine theta dA times J minus oops, P surface integral of P sine theta dA times J plus surface integral of tau I keep writing tau W just tau sine theta dA times I plus surface integral of P cosine theta dA times I. And this first group of terms, okay, these first two integrals, both act in uh, the vertical direction, okay, in the y direction, is indicated by those j unit vectors, and so this comprises that section or that, that component of our total force F that we denote lift, and this second, because we have I unit vectors okay, attached here, we denote the drag. So the force here defined as the lift in the j direction plus the drag in the i direction. Um, now the caveat here is right, these, these these you want to write down um, because this is what <coughs> this is the general way to calculate lift and drag. Uh, if we know the pressures and shear stresses are dis uh, distributed around the outside skin of an object. Uh, the caveat is that we almost never know these, or we can never, almost never write them mathematically because 
Objects are weird. Okay, the shapes of, um, of, of arbitrary bodies can't be written mathematically, and as a result, the pressure and the shear stress distribution is very rarely known. So, um, P and tau are rarely known. Drag and lift. To calculate, right? In lab four, you measured the pressure distribution roughly around that airfoil, and then you integrated that numerically. But um, the shear stress, on the other hand, there was no way. To, to, uh, to measure that. And in fact, measurement of shear stress is uh, uh, extremely difficult to do in a laboratory environment and almost impossible to do in, in, uh, generally. And this becomes increasingly true as the shapes of those objects get uh, weirder and weirder. So whenever something is difficult, Mathematically, uh, as fluid dynamicists, uh, our approach is usually to throw dimensional analysis at it. And so in most cases, dimensional analysis and modeling are employed so that we empirically quantify not the lift and the drag explicitly, but what we know is the lift coefficient, which is defined as lift over one half rho u squared times a, and the drag coefficient, which is defined as drag, oops, uh, drag likewise over one half rho u squared times a, where a We'll talk about this more um, in, in uh, the dimensional analysis of lift and drag, but A is known as a, um, a reference area and is usually a quantity um, that is given when you're considering a problem. Okay? They'll say use as the reference area the surface area of the object or the projected area of the object. That's not something you've got to know all the time. All right, we're done with the, uh, the, the, the derivations and the definitions. Uh, we're going to proceed now to employ this these, uh, through, right, right after I got done telling you how difficult it is to calculate the drag around ar arbitrary objects, we're going to calculate the drag on an object. Um, so we're going to assume we've got water flowing through uh, a bar that has a triangular cross section. Okay, so it's moving in at five feet per second, um, and the resulting pressure distribution will assume to be known. It's got this triangular pressure distribution on the two oblique faces, where it reaches a maximum pressure of 0 0.5 rho u squared and then decreases linearly to zero by the time you hit the screw vertex. And that's the same and symmetric on the upper and lower faces. And then on the back face here, our pressure distribution is given as negative 0.25 rho u squared. In this problem, we are neglecting oops, neglect shear stress. But given this information, we're now asked to calculate the lift and the drag on this bar. So this is uh, going to be a pretty simple case of plugging in pressures into those two equations we just derived for lift and drag, and uh, proceeding to carry out those integrals. So. Um, from before, we had, right, we're going to do this in two steps. So let's start with the lift. And uh, 
because the flow right, x and y, because the flow is occurring in the positive x direction, our lift is defined as a perpendicular component of force, meaning the y component. And we can break out those equations that we just used, which are negative, oops, integral of p sine theta dA plus, right, the integral of tau cosine theta dA. Well, based on this uh, assumption that we're neglecting shear stress, we can immediately knock out that second term. And so the question becomes, how do we carry out this integral? Uh, so our approach here is because we've got two or three planar surfaces, uh, is we're going to split it into three parts. And we're going to number these surfaces with the upper one here as being surface one, this lower surface two, and this rear surface three. Now, remember that we, uh, we defined theta as being not the s angle of the surface itself, but the angle of that surface is normal. And here's uh, where it, it, it's weird, and I'm not a big fan of it, um, but this is how the book does it, is that the theta is defined right, as being positive left-handed sense measured from the horizontal. Um, alternatively, if it's easier to remember, we can define this as being right, positive by symmetry, positive measured right hand in the horizontal um, if you're to start out a, a, a line upwards. <coughs> Above and measure down there. Anyway, so uh, what this means is that we've got that uh, theta for the surface 1 is theta 1 is equal to right, 60 degrees. Theta 2 is equal to negative 60 degrees. And theta 3 is equal to 180 degrees degrees. So this allows us now to split this integral as to right, negative integral over a1 of p sine theta 1 dA, right? minus integral over a2 of p sine theta 2 dA minus integral over a3 of p sine theta 3 dA. So now this, uh, this decomposition allows us to make uh, another cancellation, right, because um, now we've got Theta is constant on each of these surfaces. You can say, right, that this then works out to be square root of 3 over 2. Likewise, sine of uh, theta 2 here is going to end up being negative square root of 3 over 2. And then the sine of that 180 works out to zero. So we drop that. Ends up being. <clears throat> so now this becomes integral of negative or integral a1 p dA minus or rather plus integral over a2 p dA all time. 
times square root of 3 over 2. And now, uh, so we have to contend now finally with the integrals themselves. Uh, luckily, right, these special distributions, as I pointed out before, are triangular, right? So um, the integral is simply being a representation of so the, right, the area under the curve. We simply have to figure out, right, what's the area of this triangular distribution, which is going to be 1 half base times height. So we're given uh, right, the length of each of these uh, sides is 0 0.1 feet. We've got a maximum pressure of 0 0.5 rho u squared. So we can write, for example, the integral of A1. P dA would be one half times zero point five rho u squared times that length of that face times B. Okay. Where <clears throat> the length is that uh, zero point one foot. And so um, we could go ahead and, and carry out these integrals and, um, and, and, and do it that way, but uh, we can actually skip the step to the left, right? By inspection here, we can see that we've got symmetric pressure distributions on the upper and lower bases. In other words, both of these integrals themselves are going to give us the same value. And we've got a negative sign in front of one and a positive sign in front of the other, which tells us simply that these two integrals are going to cancel out and leave us with zero. And this makes sense in this problem, right? Because that pressure distribution on the upper and lower surfaces is, is, is uh, symmetric or symmetric, um, that's going to indicate that we develop no lift. to zero, right? No lift. However, um, now we're going to turn this over and use this integral okay, when we calculate the drag. So we're going to very quickly through the calculation of drag. Um, once again, now we can say that drag is equal to integral P cosine theta dA plus integral of tau sine theta dA. We're assuming that sine theta, or sorry, that, that the tau here is equal to zero. Break this up. <clears throat> integral over surface 1, P cosine theta 1 dA plus integral over surface 2 of P cosine theta 2 dA plus integral over surface 3, P cosine theta 3 dA. It's cosine of theta 1 and theta 2, because they're both 60 degree um, angles. It's going to work out to be 1 half, right? 1 half. And then this one's going to end up being negative 1. So we're going to end up with 1 half integral 1 of P dA plus 1 half integral over surface 2 of P dA minus integral over surface 3 of P dA. Now, we don't have any cancellation going on here. Right? Or at least not 
least not, not by inspection. Uh, but so now we've got to actually use that integral um, of the pressures. And so based on the, uh, that simplification that we worked out on the previous case for lift, right, we can replace each of these with one half right, times 0 0.5 rho u squared times L times B. Same here, one half times 0 0.5 times rho u squared times L times B. And then for this back face, we've got negative 0 0.25 rho u squared times L times B. So we can simplify this now. If we collect all of our terms, we're going to end up with this being equal to rho u squared, right, lb, or rho u squared, l times b, one-eighth plus one-eighth plus one-fourth. And so the total pressure, or total force, is going to end up being one-half LB rho U squared. So plugging in our values, okay, uh, given that this is water, oops, so rho is equal to 1.94 slugs per foot cubed, L is 0 0.1 feet, B is 4 feet, and U is equal to 5 feet per second, plugging those numerical values in, we should end up with 9.7 pounds force as the total drag. So zero lift and a positive drag force. Okay, and uh, we're going to do one more calculation, which takes about five seconds, right? Based on the definitions of the lift and drag coefficients, that we gave a couple of slides ago. All right. Lift and drag coefficients where I said CL is equal to all right, lift over one half rho u squared times A and CD is equal to drag over one half rho u squared times A. How would we rewrite those dimensional lift and drag values as lift and drag coefficients if the area that we're interested in here is the projected area? And proje projected area, what I mean is if you were to stand in front of this bar, okay, face on, looking in the direction of the flow, then what is that silhouette area? Okay. Well, viewed normally, it's simply going to be right this a rectangle that is 0 0.1 feet high. Okay, by four feet <coughs> long. So you're talking about a 0 0.4 square foot area. In other words, it's going to be B times L. We don't actually need to use any numbers, right? What did we get over here for drag? The total drag is equal to 1 half rho u squared times L times B. And we remember that the lift is equal to zero. So it's going to be one half rho u squared times b times l over one half rho u squared right, times b times l equal to one. And the lift coefficient, zero over one half rho u squared b l equal to zero. All right, um, I'm going to see you guys on Wednesday where we'll start to uh, we'll continue with the discussion of the drag. We didn't get to shape effects in this lecture, uh, but we'll pick that up in the next.